thank you everyone for joining. Um, on behalf of DSA, myself, Omaris, and Selena, we would love to, or we are happy to have you here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give a brief inter introduction to our speakers today, and then I will let them have the floor. In the meantime, um, please do hold your questions until the end. We'll have a Q&A discussion um, after the presentation, but if you have any immediate thoughts or responses or questions, please feel free to, to put those in the chat. Um, so to get us started, we have Jeremiah Johnson, who uses he, him pronouns. Jeremiah's career in the HIV and AIDS advocacy has grown from his personal experience with the virus. Jeremiah, Jeremiah was 25 when he was diagnosed with HIV while serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ukraine. When he was dismissed after testing positive, he worked with the ACLU to overturn the Peace Corps policy. Following his dismissal, Jeremiah pursued further advocacy in the field of HIV and AIDS, working as a case manager and prevented, uh, prevention specialist in rural Colorado before deciding to join before deciding to pursue his master's in public health at Columbia University. In 2013, Jeremiah joined the Treatment Action Group, or TAG, eventually becoming the director of the HIV project from 2018 to 2021. As part of TAG, he worked to promote the universal access to treatment and comprehensive HIV prevention, better and more ethical research and prevention strategies to take into account the true complexity of HIV in the United States. In 2015, he and Prep for All co-founder James uh, Prennenstein um, led advocacy that secured millions of, in funding for the New York City's sexual and wellness clinics. In 2019, he advocated for the convening of the FDA panel to review the evidence base for Discovery as Prep, uh, successfully calling for more research to be done on F slash TAF in cisgender women and transgender men. Jeremiah has, uh, was honored by POZ Magazine as one of the top 100 HIV slash AIDS ad ad activists in the United States in 2010. In 2019, Jeremiah was presented with an impact award from the Gay City News for his role in establishing the Rise and Resist and um, community grassroots organization addressing the dangers facing marginalized communities following the 2016 presidential elections. Joining Jeremiah is Kenyon Farrow, also using he, him pronouns. Kenyon is a writer, editor, and strategist who works, um, who works, who, whose work has long focused on public health and infectious disease with a focus on racial and gender and justice. Kenyon recently joined the staff for, um, of Prep for All as a managing director of advocacy and organizing. Previously, Kenyon served as a co-executive director of the Partners for Dig Dignity and Rights and as senior editor of thebody.com and thebodypro.com and US and global health policy director with the Treatment Action Group tag. He served on the board of Global uh, Black Gay Men Connect and LGBT Center for uh, the Greater Cleveland and New York Transgender Advocacy Group. He is also known for his work in organizations such as Queer for Economic Justice, Critical Resistance and Fierce. In addition to his political work, Kenyon is a prolific essayist and author. He is the co-editor uh, co of the book's Letter, uh, Letters from Young Activists, Today's Rebels Speaking Out. His work has also appeared in many anthologies, including Spirited, um, Affirming the soul, the soul of Black, Lesbian, and Gay Identity, for colored boys who have considered suicide when the rainbow is still not enough. We have been moved um, resisting racism and milit militarism in 21st century America and black gay genius answering Joseph Beam's call. His work has also appeared in publications such as Medium, POZ, The Atlantic, Out, BET.com, The Giro, Color Lines, Logo, Rewire News, City Limits, Huffington Post, and The American Prospect. Kenyon has been hailed for his work by numerous of institutions, including Out Magazine's Out 100, um, The Advocates Magazine, 40 Under 40, POZ Magazine's The POZ 100, The Roots, 20 Black LGBT Movers and Shakers, and Black Entertainment Television, which uh, designated him a modern Black history hero. Thank you both to Kenyon and Jeremiah, and I will let them um, take the floor. Great, thank you so much, Gretchen, and um, thanks to Kenyon for joining me on this presentation. Um, 
hearing your full bio reminds me of why I should be intimidated of you at all times. Um, and uh, it's really great to have a chance to talk about our work uh, with everybody here today and uh, really excited to talk about an issue that's really important to, to us that we're focused on um, all the time. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And we'll get the slides up. Can everybody see? Great. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, we were asked to come and talk about um, our advocacy and there's so many different areas <laughs> of advocacy that are um, important in terms of HIV AIDS and HIV prevention. Um, but Kenyon and I decided to focus in on a really sort of hot issue right now um, within our work and particularly a conversation within uh, the United States right now that uh, you'll, you'll all get to know a lot more about um, as we, we make it through these slides. Um, and we're talking about a national plan for PrEP access in the United States. And uh, we'll be talking about covering costs for uninsured and insured patients um, and uh, hopefully answer a, a lot of your questions and hopefully we'll have some time at the end for Q&A uh, if, uh, if any questions arise. Um, thank you again, Gretchen, for reading our whole bio. Uh, that was very, very nice. Um, uh, so I'm not gonna dwell too much more except to say that Kenyon and I both work for Prep for All. Um, our mission statement is that we ignite political action to put life-saving saving medication into the hands of everyone who needs it. Um, so a modest mission statement, um, not ambitious at all. Um, uh, and you can read more about the work that we're doing at prepforall.org. Um, we do obviously a lot of work around um, prep, but we've also expanded over the past couple of years into a lot of work around uh, COVID-19. Um, and in particular, uh, vaccine, uh, mRNA vaccine manufacturing and uh, distribution globally. Um, and so I invite you to, to come to our website and learn more. Um, one other thing that I, well, two things to, okay, maybe three things to highlight from, from the bio. Uh, one is that I just joined Prep for All officially in January. Um, and that prior to that, I was working as a, um, consultant, including uh, as a co-lead on a project out of Johns Hopkins. There's a, a team that's been working on a national prep proposal, and we're going to get into that more here today. Um, and so I'll be wearing sort of both of those hats in this conversation and really excited to present all of that. Two, um, I just wanted to highlight that um, part of why I'm so happy to be able to do this work and go out and talk with people um, not only as somebody who is a technical expert and a policy expert and a research expert on all of this, but also someone who is personally affected by these issues is because it's very important when we're having public health conversations that we are hearing directly from people who have that additional level of understanding from personal experience, being part of communities that are disproportionately affected by public health issues. And so really proud to be able to come and as best I can represent all of those different um, aspects of, of a presentation. Um, and finally, um, as Gretchen note, noted uh, in my bio, uh, I, I spent some time in Ukraine with the Peace Corps and um, it's a, not related to this presentation, but just want to um, uh, ask everyone to keep that country in mind right now with everything that's, that's going on. Um, it's, it's been a very taxing couple of weeks with all of that. Okay, so that's the longest intro ever. Um, so we'll try and uh, dive through, um, as is usually the case with um, presentations I put together, I put way too much information into them and then have to summarize them. <laughs> so I wanna try and move through as quickly as possible to highlight the important details on each slide um, and then invite you to uh, access these slides elsewhere. We've included some links on the slides with more background information. Um, so you can hopefully dive in more to topics that are of interest to you. Um, but we're gonna start with a simple question that has a complex answer that is getting more and more complex uh, year after year. And that is what is PrEP? Um, and just want to cover this because I don't know exactly where everybody is coming in on this topic and just make sure that we're all sort of up to date on where the field is at. 
So the simple answer is that PrEP is the preemptive use of antiretroviral medication to prevent acquisition of HIV for people who are HIV negative. Um, pre means before, not to be confused with post-exposure prophylaxis, which is a distinct uh, regimen of antiretrovirals that is taken for people who believe that they have been exposed uh, to HIV after an exposure. So um, as uh, public health and, and medical professionals were not always great at messaging and <laughs> communications. Uh, so don't want to have that, that confusion about PrEP versus PrEP. The PEP today is, is talking about that access to pre-exposure prophylaxis in particular. For the longest time when we said PrEP, uh, we were essentially talking about brand name Truvada, um, a co-formulated pill with two medications in it, tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, or TDF, and emtricitabine, FTC. Um, and that was approved by the FDA in 2012 uh, after being submitted uh, on behalf of, of manufacturer Gilead Sciences. Um, at the time, it was an enormous breakthrough in the field of HIV prevention. Uh, uh, particularly given that we had uh, not had a lot of success or a lot of innovation in HIV prevention for the previous sort of 30 years of the epidemic. Um, it was shown as a daily oral pill to be upwards of 99% effective in preventing acquisition sexually of HIV um, and found to be 74 to 84% uh, effective in people who inject drugs. So this was a real groundbreaker um, and something that communities desperately needed access to in 2012, let alone 10 years after. Uh, and we are coming up on the 10 year anniversary of that approval. Um, and so there was a lot of excitement in the community, a lot of conversation about could this be one of, of uh, uh, a couple of new interventions that could help us finally end HIV as an epidemic for all communities who need it. Um, however, there was a limiting factor at the time. The monthly cost of Truvada was around $1,000 a month at the time, um, which meant that we built a whole system of access around a very pricey medication, which meant that it frequently has not been accessible to the most vulnerable communities. We'll get more into that into a minute. But part of why we're having this conversation now about a national prep program is because we have a new opportunity with generic competition finally coming onto the market. At the end of 2020, the first generic competitor came into the US market um, following uh, the, the patent expirations uh, for uh, Truvada for Gilead. And as of April, 2021, there are now 12 manufacturers offering generic TDF FTC in America, uh, driving the cost as competition has a tendency to do. Uh, down to below $30 a month, meaning that we have new opportunities for intervention in this field. And we'll be talking more about what people are discussing there. I'm going to give you a little bit more of context of where the field is, but this is the particular piece that we're talking about right now, that daily oral TDF FTC. This is uh, the, the primary sort of thing that we're gonna be talking about today. However, when people discuss PrEP, there are some other ways in which uh, that, that uh, has changed in recent years. And FDA, uh, in, in 2018, the FDA approved a second oral pill also made by uh, Gilead Sciences called Discovy with a um, uh, more newly uh, uh, reviewed version of tenofovir called TAF or tenofovir alafenamide. Um, and the CDC guidelines note that it is essentially equivalent in terms of efficacy and safety um, compared to TDF FTC. Gilead would like you to believe that it is significantly more effective and safer. It's not, um, but they have a vested interest in getting us to believe so um, when the monthly price of that pill is $1,900 a month and as their true bottom market shrinks around PrEP. Something that's important to note around this is that Gilead did not conduct phase three trial research in cisgender women and trans men. Um, and so the FDA actually declined to give a broader indication for all populations uh, for PrEP 
Um, and so actually it's only an option right now for men to have sex with men and transgender women. So it's a, a complicated additional wrinkle in the conversation of what is PrEP. I'm gonna jump down just one to say that we also have now a third regimen uh, that was just approved in December, 2021. Um, it's a long acting injectable version of uh, Vives uh, uh, medication, Cabotegravir. It's known by brand uh, name, Apritude. It's a bi-monthly shot that you can get in the hip. It's uh, intramuscular. Um, and it has been shown to be potentially a really great option for some different populations. Uh, but as is the case with Descovy, the price is gonna be an issue. It's $22,500 a year, um, making it complicated in terms of talking about things. One final thing I wanna uh, just bring up briefly in terms of answering the question, what is PrEP? is that we also have an alternative dosing regimen for oral TDF-FTC. Um, it's not FDA approved, but it is discussed in the CDC guidelines. It's called on-demand or 211 prep, something that we probably should have more advocacy to get out there because people need additional options. This is for uh, particularly men who have sex with men who have intermittent risk as opposed to ongoing risk. Um, so for that person who maybe they don't always have risk, but they're going to that weekend in Puerto Vallarta and they know that it's gonna be a party, um, they can take uh, two uh, doses of TDF-FTC in the two to 24 hours ahead of the possible exposure, one pill 24 hours after that and another pill 24 hours after that. And that's been found to be highly um, effective as well for that community. So a lot on that slide, a lot of information to answer a complicated question. I'm gonna ask you to really hone in on the daily oral TDF FTC piece and the conversation that that's helping to precipitate. So that's what PrEP is. Who's getting PrEP versus who needs it? Um, these are a couple of visuals to help sort of break that down, at least in terms of the conversation around race and ethnicity. On the left side, you'll see from CDC data, new diagnoses broken down by race and ethnicity within the United States for 2019. As has always been the case with the HIV epidemic, it disproportionately impacts black and brown communities, um, uh, though it does uh, affect white people as well. Um, and so ultimately, if we're not getting access to uh, black and Hispanic Latinx communities, then we're really not doing our job as public health advocates. Um, and unfortunately, as you'll see on the right hand side of your screen, we are not being very successful in this respect. Despite overwhelming need, um, we're disproportionately getting PrEP to white communities compared to Black and Latinx communities. The CDC estimates that 1.2 million Americans overall could most benefit from PrEP access. Overall, we're not doing great. We're only getting maybe to about 25% of those individuals according to a CDC estimate. However, when you break that down by white individuals within that calculation, we're reaching 66%. If you look at uh, Hispanic Latinx communities, it's only 16%. And for Black and African American communities, it's only 9%. So there's tremendous need. There are other ways that this breaks down, not well, including around gender identity. We're not doing a great job of getting it to transgender and gender diverse communities. We're also not doing it a great job with cisgender women and, um, and trans men who also need access and do make up around 20% of new uh, diagnoses within the US every year. So uh, that's who needs PrEP. Why are they not getting PrEP? There are many barriers. Uh, the American healthcare system is complicated. And when you're dealing with marginalized and vulnerable and stigmatized communities, it gets even more complicated. Um, so this is a certainly non-exhaustive list of the many barriers that people might experience. The first one is the one that we're gonna be talking about the most today. Um, we're gonna be talking about covering all of the costs associated with PrEP. Um, and the fragmented and complicated coverage that uh, in particular uninsured populations, uninsured populations, and even some people who do have insurance are experiencing that keep them from being able to access PrEP. It's a major barrier, something that doesn't get addressed enough, but something that has momentum now. And we're gonna to talk to you about some of the ideas, the opportunities and the challenges that are getting out there. Um, in addition to that, there are also issues with net network inadequacy. 
Um, so just because you have coverage doesn't mean that you have access to a provider, that you have access to labs that are geographically accessible to you, that are being provided by people who uh, look like you, who understand you, who have cultural competency, who have a background that works for you, um, you know, and, and people need options in terms of having different providers to go to. And so that's another challenge that needs to be addressed. Part of that network inadequacy can also come from physician biases, which are very well documented. There was a really interesting study that came out of Yale a few years ago that showed that amongst medical students who were surveyed there, that they were more likely to provide PrEP to someone who reported that they were going to consistently use condoms versus individuals who weren't going to consistently use condoms. They were less likely to provide PrEP to them, representing a certain moralizing amongst uh, providers that can tend to happen around access to preventive health care. And it's actually a paradox. If the existing prevention options are not working for people, you want to give them more options, not restrict them. Um, but there are these sorts of biases that we have a hard time getting around sometimes within healthcare systems. There are, of course, also many isms within healthcare, racism, transphobia, misogyny, um, all sorts of biases that keep people from being able to access. Some of that is built into physician biases. And we know there have been really robust studies showing that um, Black patients are less likely to be offered PrEP uh, by a doctor compared to their white counterparts. Um, there's also just structural issues with it. Front of house staff, do they know how to work with marginalized communities? What does it mean to walk into a space where they don't speak your language, where nobody looks like you? Um, all of these things come together to make it incredibly hard to access things. I'm not going to go in depth into some of the perverse incentives in the field that also make it difficult. There's a link there if you want to read more on this interesting phenomenon within HIV AIDS activism. Um, but there, uh, for a number of, of clinics, there's actually an incentive to try and keep medication costs high because it actually translates into more funding for a, a community clinic, largely through a program called the 340B program. Um, and that also contributes to high costs that limits our ability to have innovative models to get things out to people. And then of course, there are just the historic issues that we deal with all sorts of um, healthcare interventions, lack of awareness, societal stigma, things that keep people away from going to providers because either they don't know the intervention exists or they're afraid to access it because they're afraid of being judged, discriminated against, um, or done some other kind of harm. So um, we're not doing a good job getting it to the people who need it. Uh, and uh, those are some of the barriers. I'm gonna hone in on that coverage barrier, as I said, we were gonna talk about and Kenny and I are gonna get into more of that. But an opening question for people who maybe aren't within the communities that are most affected is why cover prep? For those of us who need it, it's simple. We need it, cover it, give it to us. Um, and it's also just the right and ethical thing to do for affected communities, particularly with so many of these barriers that we're dealing with um, and particularly coverage barriers are just dumb um, and not, there's just no good reason <laughs> for people to not have access. So we really should just find a way around. Um, but beyond that, there are some more, you know, policymaker oriented reasons um, that advocates can have out there to talk about why it's important to cover this. At generic rates with TDFFTC, PrEP can be cost saving to the US healthcare system. That's because for every individual who is diagnosed with HIV, there's an estimated lifetime average cost to the healthcare system of $500,000. That's incredibly expensive. Um, uh, as someone living with HIV, I always like to say, that doesn't mean that you're going to be sick and in the hospital, that you can live a fabulous, lovely, wonderful life and still have uh, HIV. It's not about that, but it is certainly a situation where a, a cheaper prevention option for it is absolutely worth it to the healthcare system and can help save those costs to the system. There's also a policy imperative in the United States. We have made a commitment as a country to end HIV as an epidemic by 2013, and PrEP is essential to that goal. Um, and what we mean by ending the epidemic is actually driving down new infections to such a degree that the epidemic stops sort of self-perpetuating itself um, in all communities and to make sure that we start to actually see a point where it's, it's very 
uh, rare and less likely that we're starting to see um, HIV. And, and that ultimately will really compound those cost savings to the healthcare system. It's especially important to do that given some of the compelling evidence that we have on population level efficacy in driving down new infections from places like Australia and the UK, where we've seen even modest increases and, and imperfect increases in PrEP access have translated into big wins for driving down these epidemics um, in, in marginalized communities. And of course, if we really do truly care about equity, if we do truly care about eliminating disparities, we can't continue to have this disparate sort of access to PrEP across different communities. Okay, so that's why we should cover it. What needs to be covered? Um, when we talk about coverage, it's not just the medications. Um, in the CDC guidelines, you'll see that there are other services that have to be covered within this. Um, we need to, uh, because this is an intervention for HIV negative individuals, we need to make sure that people are HIV negative. If you're HIV positive, you need to go on a full treatment regimen, not just TDFFTC. Otherwise you have dangers of, of developing resistance as someone who's HIV positive. So we need to make sure that we're doing that HIV testing at the start in particular. Breakthrough infections are incredibly rare with PrEP. Um, but we do need to still sort of track and make sure that uh, people aren't seroconverting and then staying on an inadequate treatment regimen. We need to make sure that all of the recommended lab services are being covered for individuals as well. This is a huge gap in coverage for people in general in the US. Um, that includes sexually transmitted infections testing, that includes hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and anyone who's on any form of tenofovir needs to make sure that they are having their kidneys checked um, le less frequently these days than used to be recommended, but it is important just to make sure that any rare complications with that are being um, tracked. As you'll see from the image on the right, um, and this is a bit of an, uh, an outdated estimate, uh, but, uh, but still recent enough that we could talk about it. You could see that in a world where we're going off of generic TDFFTC prices, that a disproportionate uh, area of cost for uh, an individual can be in physician visits. So it's important that we're factoring that into the conversation as well. And it's something that'll be um, included in a little more conversation a little later. And then there are supportive services. Healthcare in America is complicated and we sometimes need access to things like prep navigation. We need to make sure that there's funding for those services as well. Something not included in these guidelines, um, but things that we've talked about within prep for all uh, that might need to be additional conversations going on is um, the ethical imperative. If you're testing people for STIs and hepatitis C, uh, what is our plan to get them coverage on treatment as well? Uh, you know, is it okay to let people know that they have a condition and then uh, not treat them for it? And those are some things that we need to factor in the conversation about coverage. Um, so uh, very quickly, just going to talk a little bit about some of the quality. So it's not just dollars, it's the quality of coverage as well. Um, theoretically, a lot of insurance companies will cover things and then put up a million different sort of, you know, administrative barriers to people and other ways to sort of keep from having to actually pay for services. So we don't want that, we want quality coverage. And some of the things that we've talked about within Prep for All and that uh, we've also discussed within the Johns Hopkins plan that I've been working on are these sort of tenants. We wanna make sure that we're centering equity um, and, and not having that as just sort of an added thing that we talk about afterward. We wanna make sure that we're minimizing administrative burden for vulnerable individuals who need PrEP. Uh, we know that there are a lot of sort of uh, social network programs that exist out there, but with income requirements having to be met, burdensome paperwork requirements, uh, renewal applications, all sorts of complicated things like that. It uh, is intentionally designed to keep people from being able to consistently access care um, and create sort of a climate of scarcity. And we want to make sure we're not doing that. We want it to be truly affordable to individuals. We want it to be comprehensive. So, you know, we don't want it just covering medications or just covering labs. We want to make sure that it's covering all of those things that we've been talking about. We want it to be accessible. Again, that network inadequacy, we want to make sure that geographically and culturally that we're addressing this for people in all sorts of different contexts. Something that at Prep for All we talk a lot about is making sure that we're reaching that user-friendly sort of status as well. 
So if you design a whole program and it's designed by policy wonks who don't understand about those end user interfaces, that can really you know, be a detriment to your program. You need to make sure that you're coming up with options for enrollment and interface that really makes sense and are intuitive to your end users. And then finally, with any sort of systemic intervention, you want to make sure that it's going to be sustainable and adaptable across different uh, uh, settings and different sort of situations. Uh, the U.S. is a big place. You have rural places, you have urban places, you have people coming from all sorts of different communities. You want to make sure it works in the Northeast, in the South, in the West, expansion, non-expansion. And those are some of the sort of adaptable qualities and sustainable qualities that we want to make sure that we have. So much of the rest of the presentation is going to talk about a national plan for uninsured and underinsured individuals. Kenyon's going to jump in in just a second to talk about what he's been doing with insured populations um, and some of the context there. But uh, before we jump there, I wanted to give you a sense of the scale of the issue to talk about this for uninsured and underinsured individuals. This isn't just a niche issue. It's not just a small percentage of Americans that are currently left outside of potential protections and coverage for PrEP services. So over 30 million Americans are still uninsured with the majority of those individuals living in uh, Medicaid non-expansion states. Um, that's also not going to be just a cross cut, cross section of the entire population of America. If you were to look at those 30 million Americans, they're gonna be disproportionately black, disproportionately Latinx. And we also have estimates that transgender and gender diverse populations are experiencing high rates of, of uh, being uninsured the CDC in a recent survey of transgender women found that 17% uh, lacked any kind of insurance coverage. And so uh, it, that's much of what that uninsured population looks like. Even in situations where we are making some improvements for um, publicly or for privately insured individuals, something that Kenyon is going to go into more, um, there are uh, 23 million estimated individuals uh, on so-called grandfathered private insurance plans that don't fall under Affordable Care Act or so-called Obamacare mandates for coverage of certain preventive services. These individuals might have coverage. It may cover PrEP to a certain degree, it may not, um, but they are not mandated under ACA. And so that's another huge population that we need to make sure they're insured. And also, even for those privately insured plans, as Kenny will go into more, um, uh, when the ACA applies, compliance is slow. And we're certainly not seeing all providers immediately, so, you know, just because you have a policy doesn't mean that everyone's going to comply with it unless it's enforced. Um, and so there's a lot of work and advocacy to do that. And even in all of those situations, say that you have private coverage, say that you, um, you know, that they are covering PrEP there are still gonna be some individuals that need other options. Um, so a key population, for example, is uh, for individuals who are under the age of 26, who are still on their parents' insurance. They might be afraid of, um, of uh, uh, notices going home to their parents around explanation of benefits. Um, and so they might not wanna use that coverage in order to access PrEP. So there's a lot of need there and that's what a program needs to address. And I will hand it over to Kenyon for the next couple of slides. Awesome, uh, thank you, Jeremiah. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, kind of the issues uh, that we, one issue that we've been working on specifically uh, pertaining to people who are uh, insured and um, using PrEP. Uh, and I should say too, I, I have been uh, on PrEP since 2015 and um, once I got on PrEP, became more acutely aware of the kinds of challenges with insurance and coverage that a lot of people living with HIV or who have other chronic conditions have to deal with on a daily basis because of just the way our systems are, are set up. Um, so back in, uh, well, last year in 2021, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Department of Labor um, issued a kind of FAQ, like a frequently asked questions document to clarify uh, a ruling that they had already made earlier about um, how 
um, both uh, insur employer based um, health plans. Uh, so, you know, uh, health insurance that people get through their jobs and, you know, ACA or Obamacare marketplace plans need to cover PrEP, right? And, and their ruling basically uh, said that these kinds of plans had to cover the full cost of medications, uh, visits, uh, labs and screenings with no cost sharing to patients. So that means no co-pays, no, nothing out of pocket if you're on PrEP and you have, uh, you know, insurance again through your employer or one of the uh, ACA marketplace plans. One of the challenges with this ruling, though, is that there is currently no accountability mechanism for insurers that are uh, not adhering to this ruling. We uh, hosted a webinar uh, back in, I believe it was in October, with uh, staff members from uh, Health and Human Services, uh, as well as from uh, Center for Medicaid and Medi Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, and uh, directly asked them this question about accountability, and uh, they didn't really <laughs> have a have a have an answer for us. Other than if people find themselves in a situation where they're still being charged by their health insurer, they should report the. First, obviously, you know, do go through the process of, of, you know, going through the claims department to get your to get reimbursed if you were charged or to get a charge taken off um, or to report the health plan to their state, you know, kind of insurance, you know, uh, bureau, which um, I'm sure uh, many of you do not know because <laughs> I don't even know who. I'm in the state of Ohio, and I don't know who the state, uh, you know, insurance regulatory body is, but, uh, you know, people are supposed to do that. So um, what we decided to do was to uh, basically create a, a form and kind of promote it through social media and our listservs or whatever, um, asking people, hey, if you're on PrEP and you have, you know, uh, in insurance through your job or an ACA marketplace plan, um, and you're still you were charged for some you know aspect of your prep care, whether you were charged for labs or for uh, prescription copay or for your doctor visits, et cetera. Uh, we uh, you know we want to know so we can try to kind of document these cases. And um, to date, we opened that um, back in uh, like mid November. And to date, we have about 52 uh, people who have filled it out, which isn't a great number. But it is telling us a little bit about what's happening. And we subsequently have been having conversations with uh, some with some of the lab companies that, you know, um, you know, are providing laboratory, uh, you know, services for for clinics and uh, telehealth, uh, you know, uh, clients, et cetera. And we are beginning to see pretty widespread, I think we can say, insurance denials, especially for lab costs, which tend to be the most expensive uh, cost in the prep care, uh, you know, in, in especially in one visit when a generic, you know, uh, because we have a generic drug, the uh, cost of that is now much lower if you're on the generic. But, um, you know, the labs can be in the several hundred dollars, you know, per per lab, um, and people are finding themselves with these, you know, four, five hundred, six hundred dollar bills. So again, we began documenting these cases, and just recently, um, and then communicating directly. So I've been actually sending letters to every insurance company that uh, people have identified, charge them, uh, and I've gotten only a responses from two insurance companies about those things. Um, and so far, uh, only a few people have been uh, returned uh, their their money. So um, there's, and as I said, there's some other advocates that are beginning to focus on this. And um, I put a link to this a CNN story that just came out on Monday about this issue. So it's sort of the first press piece that we've seen uh, looking at this issue. Next slide. Um, so another kind of piece I want to talk about is um, the clinical guidelines for PrEP. Um, so what typically happens, um, for those of you that are not like, you know, kind of healthcare and public health geeks like Jeremiah and I, what happens um, after the FDA typically approves uh, a drug, then either um, CDC, uh, Centers for Disease Control, or uh, sometimes uh, 
kind of nonprofit uh, groups like the Infectious Disease Society of America, which is a, a an umbrella organization for uh, you know infectious disease uh, specialists, uh, physicians in in the country. Sometimes those institutions will do it, but they will typically write sort of guidelines for how a particular drug or sometimes a medical device uh, should be used and in what circumstances. Uh, and what kind of screening you want to do to make sure that it's going to the appropriate people or whatever. So um, PrEP was approved in 2012, I think as Jeremiah said. So this is the 10th anniversary of PrEP's approval, right? And so it took several years to actually even get uh, clinical guidelines written for PrEP. So many doctors just didn't even know how to prescribe it um, or what they else they should be doing because it took so long for the guidelines to come out. One of the things that happened in the original um, guidelines that were written were uh, that you had to kind of determine if the person was sexually enough at risk or or uh, an injection yeah. drug user or some other uh, sort of distinction um, to determine whether or not that they were you know should should in fact be be using prep, and so. When you understand the what we often call in public health the social determinants of health, which basically um, you know suggests that when you start to see um, higher rates of you know disease of whatever kind in in different communities, that those things are often not about that community having more sort of you know risk factors per se right so there's been a lot of research that's already shown that despite the fact that um you know black folks in the united states have far more uh uh hiv disparities than their white counterparts but it is not because black folks are having more unprotected vaginal or anal sex or use drugs at higher rates or other sort of behavioral factors that would put them more at risk. But there are structural issues, right? Like mo mo still to this day, most uh, Black people live in the U.S. South and most of the Southern states did not expand Medicaid, which means that, they're, that the coverage gap for people who are um, without insurance are disproportionately uh, black and brown folks based on where we live, right? As, as one example of how structures impact. So um, because doctors had to kind of do these detailed sexual histories and asking people if, how many people you had sex with, did you have sex with somebody who was uh, living with HIV or whose status you didn't know, et cetera, um, we were missing lots of people who actually could have benefited from PrEP because they didn't fit those uh those behavioral characteristics even though based on maybe where they live in the country based on whether they have insurance or not and whether they're getting hiv screenings but because they don't have insurance etc they were at far higher risk of hiv uh just having a normal sex life like everybody else and so a 2018 study um, of cisgender women in the southern states um showed that uh there were 246 women in this study who were um, screened for PrEP eligibility, right? So asked these questions, you know, about their sexual risk factors or drug use, et cetera. And only uh, 72 were found to meet uh, the CDC guidelines for PrEP. Um, and then of that, only of the 72 women, only four of them, one, two, three, four, not 4%, four, four people had any prior knowledge about PrEP. Um, and only one uh, woman had taken it before, but 86% of them said that they would be they would be willing to take it if they knew it was effective, right? So we had a also just kind of a, a knowledge issue in there as well that we just have not done like big national campaigns to tell people that prep exists and how to to access it. But recently, um, just a, in December of 2021, the CDC updated its guide, guidelines to really change this dynamic of having to ask people detailed questions about their sex lives in, in order to uh, see if they were eligible for PrEP, but really change the question to, uh, are you having sex or do you want to be, <laughs> basically? And if you are having sex or you want to be having sex, you should know about PrEP. And, uh, and if you're interested in PrEP, then we should make sure that you are HIV negative, so taking an HIV test, 
taking a test for uh, viral hepatitis, for hepatitis B um, to make sure folks are uh, hepatitis B negative, um, and then you know start start folks on prep. So those guidelines have recently changed, um, which should hopefully make uh, access at least uh, better or more people uh, being able to discuss prep with their doctors without feeling like you know, they must be uh, viewed as promiscuous or some other, uh, you know, thing that some people consider derogatory in order to access PrEP. Well, Next slide. This is she. Oh, I think we're getting a, uh, someone speaking. Apologies, okay. I just, I just muted them. No worries, no worries. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's, there's a lot that needs to be done. And I think, you know, something that, you know, to Kenyon's point, we've created this climate of scarcity around a really expensive medication. <laughs> and so we've limited letting no people know, uh, letting people know about it. And so there's a lot of movement right now in this sort of opportunity to um, try and, and you know, remedy some of these disparities that we've seen, a lot of these barriers. There's the you know, advocacy that Kenyon is doing in terms of uh, private insurance and ensuring compliance around uh, you know, coverage of, of TDF, FTC as PrEP. Um, there's the messaging component that is incredibly important, especially that it was always unethical to not let people know more about it. Um, but especially now. Um, and so there's a lot of work around that. And then, of course, again, there's this piece of trying to come up with a solution that works for the people who have really fallen outside of healthcare access and coverage um, and a movement for a national program that is, is really focusing on uninsured populations. So very quickly, existing there are existing programs, but they're fragmented, they're complex. Um, they don't usually cover everything. And so people fall through a lot of the cracks. There has been progress and a movement. And I think we're hopeful that soon we're actually going to see a national commitment to a national program. Part of what's led us to this moment is through work that Prep for All uh, did in, in partnership with other community advocates to press the CDC to allow uh, existing grant funding to pay for ancillary prep services. So oftentimes manufacturers to deflect from the fact that their medication is so expensive will have medication assistance programs where you can theoretically get the medication um, and, and can get the medication. Um, uh, however, it won't cover lab costs. Um, and so, uh, uh, which helps them to sort of limit their uh, challenges, uh, 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 the amount of free medication that they're having to cover. Um, and so Prep for All was really instrumental in helping to get this conversation going. Um, there are two congressional bills right now that are actually calling for a significant new investment in Prep. Um, and that was also supported recently by a sign-on letter that uh, was sent in with 111 organizational signatures calling on President Biden to fund a national Prep program. By and large, those are funding conversations and don't specifically talk about unique and innovative ways to spend that funding, um, drawing from other existing successes and um, getting out preventive healthcare interventions. Um, uh, however, the Johns Hopkins based team that I've been working with, and I'm more than a little bit biased, but I'm totally going to plug this as much as I can today, um, uh, has come up with a really interesting novel strategy, loosely based on the Vaccines for Children's program, um, that is really about uh, dramatically scaling up coverage and expanding network adequacy. And I'm gonna skip ahead just because we are running a little low on time. And I wanna make sure that you get to the meat of this plan. And I really hope that you go and follow up uh, and, and click on the, the plan and read more about it. There's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. Um, or you can just look up, you know, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, prep access plan, and I'm sure something will, will pop up. Um, or maybe someone can put it in the chat if, it, if they, they have it handy. Um, but there are sort of three parts to this plan. Part A is really focusing on taking this moment with generic access and using the CDC to nationally per bulk purchase that medication and come up with innovative ways to get it to pharmacy networks so it's really expanding cheap pharmacy access to uninsured 
and Medicaid covered individuals. Part B is really trying to uh, ratchet up the clinical access. So within clinical settings, including places like STI clinics, um, which are under-resourced a lot of times, to provide options for clinical providers to access medication that they can distribute right on site if they want. Um, because we know that same day, just handing that bottle of prep to people can really make a difference in them scaling it up. Also providing a comprehensive network of laboratory services that uh, is widely accessible for individuals to go and get those labs for free. So that's in the clinical setting. Part C is trying to leverage up a non-traditional network. So for a lot of people, healthcare access doesn't work for them for many different reasons. There's a lot that we need to do to fix the healthcare system, but they might be linked to other services in their community, domestic violence programs, homeless services, harm reduction services, and particularly in an era of telehealth, this is a time when we can widely expand and enroll a network of non-traditional community sites, link them with telehealth, and get them access through pharmacy, through that pharmacy network for the prescriptions and access to laboratory services, including lots of options. Some key features of the plan, just to go over very quickly. This is for uninsured and Medicaid covered individuals. We've included the Medicaid covered individuals because there are network adequacy issues and other potential issues that are leading to low uptake and persistence issues. So staying on prep issues that we're seeing compared to private insurance. So we think that there's possibly a, a, a role for that. We don't talk about the underinsured explicitly, but it should hopefully through advocacy be an option there as well. Um, it's about making this about eligibility for providers and not patients. So enroll that network put the burden of eligibility and enrollment on the provider network so they can independently determine what patients have access to the program, get rid of those income eligibility, all of those burdensome sort of requirements. To focus on generic TDF-FTC, but it's not limited to that. There's nothing saying the government can't sit down and negotiate with Viv and Gilead to get a reasonable price to get access to Discovy and Apertude as well. So that's something that we like to highlight as well for, for some uh, concerns around that. We wanna highlight that flexibility. Some people need same day access. Some people need mail order access. Some people can go to the pharmacy and it's fine. Some people 30 day prescriptions is fine. Some people they need 90 day prescriptions. We wanna make sure that there's flexibility within all of that for people to access it. Uh, this plan has a plan for contracts with national labs of last resort. Just to quickly summarize that, the idea would be that that would be accessible to the uninsured populations. We still want Medicaid covered, though, to go and access labs through their existing providers. Um, and there's more about that within the plan since we don't have time. I'm not going to go in further. And then we want to make sure that we're supporting through CDC the establishment of that network, working with state and local health departments to really meaningfully enroll that large provider network so that people have a large network of care. Final slide here, um, we're really hopeful that this is gonna be announced soon. We don't know, no one knows, but fingers crossed and hopefully your school will have played a really important part in influencing that conversation. But just getting policy doesn't mean that there aren't massive implementation uh, considerations and something where Prep for All is going to be working in terms of implementation and taking the plan even further is that one, we've been calling for this at Prep for All since 2018. So we're old hats at it. And we wanna make sure that we take our expertise for part of the conversation. We wanna make sure that there's Prep user partnership at all levels in the development and the implementation of this. We wanna make sure that those physician costs are getting covered. That's not always something from a policy advocacy standpoint that's as movable right now, but something that we wanna make sure is part of the conversation. We might want to expand that lab coverage uh, to beyond just a certain network and maybe wider. And we want to bring in that conversation about wider se sexual health and wellness, including um, STI and HCV treatments and a broader focus on that health. So more on that to come. I hope you download the slides and read more on this. Have a little school pride for everything that your team has been doing there. Um, and uh, just incredibly happy to have been able to share this. And I know we went on long but appreciate you sticking with us. Thank you. Also, I just put my, my email in the chat. I see Cynthia, you raising your hand. 
Yeah, so first of all, a huge thanks to both of you. It's just um, such a sobering conversation for all we know about, you know, life-saving medications, the process that um, so many people are going through to try to bring this to the reality, to meet the needs of so many individuals um, who should all have access to the to treatments that are evidence-based. I guess my question for you is, in your sort of role of knowing so much about the science, so much in personal experience and so much in advocacy, are there efficacy lessons learned that you think are unique to these treatments or that um, that we should be mindful of uh, in especially considering this sort of population? Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Kenyon, do you wanna say something first or I can? Um, sure, I'll start first. Um, yeah, I think that it, the lessons are applicable. Um, one, just in the space of, you know, the issues around drug pricing and what happens when uh, government, uh, we, so we didn't talk that much about how much money that actually we as the, you know, public, uh, you know, public funding, some people say taxpayer funding, I think that actually creates a weird kind of class dynamic, but so I say public funding, um, people who publicly funded, um, you know, the research for um, prep to happen, um, you know, for the approval 10 years ago, and, um, you know, Gilead did not put any money into research. And in fact, the, the researcher who did those early studies um, testified to Congress a couple of years ago, which Prepper All was also a part of that hearing, that um, he had to really argue with them to even give him enough drug to conduct the trials. And yet they were allowed to then charge, you know, I think sort of started around $1,600 for a 30 day course. And it just, the price just kept increasing, even though more people were using it, which is, you know, um, and the, the brand name Tr Truvada still costs that much as does their other drug, Discovy. Now, this is applicable to other things because we are, you know, obviously seeing similar dynamics in say uh, the EpiPen, right, which, actually and, and like so this sort of sleight of hand with that example is the drug itself in the EpiPen is a generic but what but the FDA allowed the company that made the sort of pen device uh keeps that at uh as a brand name product um that then they charge you know ridiculous amount of money and there have been uh, you know dozens of news stories over the last maybe hundreds of the last like five years of people who uh you know don't uh you know uh don't have that medication available when they need it or um you know the price of we talked a little bit about injection drug use but the um you know price of of um i just went up on the name of it but uh you know the medication that you inject when folks are are overdosing right um that there have been different issues around price spikes and that so i do think there is something to be learned or just if you're kind of interested in both kind of intellectual and, and patent and property, intellectual property and patent issues and how it impacts uh, healthcare in terms of cost and what happens downstream of cost. Uh, it, it is in a lot of cases too, and I'll say this and shut up that, um, you know, we, a lot, like I know, and Jeremiah knows this, and, and you know, my years of doing work on prep, there are you know people who will say, oh, you know, the pricing issues isn't creating like you know access because you know give the drug companies have been so benevolent to give us these copay cards and these like patient assistance programs, but we know things that the insurance companies do like prior authorization is about as a cost containment mechanism. I also think that when I describe like some of the clinical guidelines issues, I think that, you know, I can't prove it, but I think it's, it's hard to, to, to imagine that in the backs of people's heads when they were writing those initial guidelines that like public health programs were not going to be able to afford mass access to PrEP. So then you kind of, you know, circumscribe it around the smallest community that you can kind of identify that needs it, which created other problems. So so I, I think that there, there are lessons to be learned uh, or to be used prep to think about the sort of national, you know, tenor around drug costs and pharma companies like influencing public policy around costs and around healthcare systems, including Medicare for all, which I know DSA is a um, generally proponent of as am I. So, you know, those are my thoughts. 
Do I have time for two quick responses to that or do you need to shut it down? Okay. Uh, two things is, uh, you know, advocacy for prevention is not the same as advocacy for treatment. The motivations for being engaged in a complicated healthcare system are different for a disease that you have versus one that you might have. And so when we're talking about coming up with simple access, something that has been a problem within broader HIV AIDS advocacy is I think that we've continued to sort of call community advocacy being those of us who are living with the virus. And to be sure there is overlap there, but it's very important. And something that's exciting about PrEP for All is that it is bringing in that PrEP user perspective as well. And there's, there's something different about that. The other thing that's important around these prevention conversations is choosing the right fights. And I think that this is something that we're seeing a lot in terms of COVID-19 right now. There's this interesting phenomenon where we get to fighting amongst ourselves about use of barrier methods. Um, we fight vociferously um, to where, you know, and not that, that it's not important to raise awareness and have these conversations, but we could do so much more if people would talk about these intellectual property fights. Um, if we were talking about getting people a whole range of options to meet their needs for avoiding a disease, as opposed to mandating that you have to, I mean, I know that's a triggering word, we're all triggered, um, but like, you know, it's sometimes I think it's important that we make sure that we're not choosing the fight that feels easier because we're just, you know, mandating each other's sort of behavior, but actually makes you know, really powerful people and really uh, resource people have to come to the table in a good faith effort to scale up things like vaccines, you know, biomedical interventions, cures, treatments, and not just keep focusing on, on you know, those, those other methods. So those are, those are a couple of thoughts that come to mind for me. Yeah, hugely appreciate both your reflections on that. I think a lot of lessons learned and how we frame arguments and, and the incredible coalitions that you've been building and part of over a long time to really focus on prevention. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you both. If anyone has any last moment thoughts, I know we have about a minute left, um, but just thank you both to our and to everyone who attended today. Thanks again for having us. Thank Indeed, you so thanks. much. Take care.